the Nazis, of course, as we know, not long after they come to power, they dismantle all of the trade unions. They dismantle all of the trade unions. But workers, of course, still need to feel like they've got a voice, like somebody's looking out for them. So the Nazis create, essentially, their own trade union, their own state-run trade union. It is the National Socialist German Workers' Party, after all, right? And this trade union was called DAF, Deutsche Arbeiten uh, Front, the German Labor Front. Okay? German Labor Front. So the German Labor Front um, is led by a guy by the name of Robert Ly. Robert Ly. Robert Ly, he was in World War I, I think, if memory serves, I think he was a pilot in World War I, a fighter pilot. And he got shot down, and he had these, like, really bad headaches. He had, like, a really, uh, almost not quite brain damage, but something was wrong with his head. And he was in, like, constant pain. And uh, so he was almost always drunk. He drank a lot to kind of dull the pain. I actually had a, uh, uh, so when I did my, my master's degree, um, I worked under a, a, a which I did primarily on Nazi Germany. I worked under a professor named Ronald Smelser at the University of Utah, and he had written uh, a biography of Robert Ly. And he wrote this biography of Robert Ly. So he, he'd tell me a lot about Robert Ly. Um, and he says, you know, you don't want to ever have sympathy for a Nazi, but apparently this guy was just in chronic pain all the time. And he kind of described that. But he was, he was kind of a nut job. He was, he was, well, I mean, you know, for Nazis, of course, they're all nut jobs, but... So the Nazis create this organization, Strength Through Joy. So you can see the, their symbol here is the swastika in, in a gear, right? Swastika in a gear. And again, it is, as you can imagine, <laughs> incredibly... I mean, a labor union has money coming in and out of it all the time. This is another incredibly, incredibly corrupt uh, organization. Incredibly corrupt organization. It claims to represent workers' rights and look out for workers, but in, the re in reality, it really only looks out for its own interests. The, 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 the Nazis play an interesting game here because workers' rights really don't do anything. They don't advance. They don't get better under the Nazis. Workers are there to be worked, right? And so the Nazis don't really concede much of significance to them. They don't do much of significance to them. Um, but what they do is have this propaganda and spectacle that makes it look like the Nazis are doing something for the workers. And really what they do is they invent this system they call strength through joy. Strength through joy. This is a program that is very successful for the DAF and the Nazi party. And what it is, is essentially, it allows working class Germans, working class Germans, paycheck to paycheck Germans, who can't really afford luxuries, it allows them to take seemingly extravagant vacations. It allows them to take seemingly extravagant vacations at little cost. They pay for it, but it's not very much. And one of the big things they would do is they would go here on these cruise ships. Most Germans, working class Germans, couldn't afford to go on a cruise. And yet, these workers, they can have a few days off where they can go on a cruise, they can take their family on a cruise. Well, that sounds great, you know. We couldn't ride on cruises during the Weimar Republic, but now the Nazis are taking care of us. or letting us go on these great vacations. Sometimes they would take them to like skiing vacations. Uh, you know, they'd, the Nazis would rent out like these um, hotels and stuff, and they could take get these really cheap hotel rooms and go on these skiing vacations and stuff. And so there's all these these, these like cheap vacations that are, like I say, seemingly extravagant. Now I said they're seemingly extravagant because on a vacation, you know, you can kind of do what you want to do. I mean, you have an itineraries and stuff, but you can kind of do what you want to do. It's your time. It's your free time. You're there to have fun. One of the things, though, the Nazis make sure happens on these cruises or these, these ski vacations is a good amount of your time is being spent instructed in the party line. So you're getting Nazi indoctrination, essentially courses, classes, while you're on these vacations, right? 
So that's kind of the real price you have to pay for going on these vacations. Now, in addition to the vacations, there would also be concerts. You could get you know, cheap concert tickets or other cultural events you could go to for free. But a, it also, you, you know, typically working class people didn't get tennis lessons or horse riding lessons. You could do that. Your kids could do that. So they, 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 they appeared to give working class people access to things that before only the wealthy could afford. So it's a huge propaganda coup, right? But at the same time, you're, you're getting this indoctrination. You're expected to, um, to conform to that. Incidentally, just uh, the Wilhelm Gustloff right here, the ship that was, it was commissioned as a strength and joy ship. It specifically would take people on Baltic cruises. In 1945, this was used as a troop transport, and it was evacuating... Um, it was evacuating German troops from the Baltic states back to uh, Germany proper. And as it was being evacuated, it was struck and hit by a, um, a torpedo from a Russian submarine. And to this day, this remains the largest maritime disaster in history. More people lost their lives in the Wilhelm Gustloff than in any other sinking ship ever. So strength or joy, it cost, the whole program cost about... Uh, 29 million Reichsmarks a year for the German government. About 29 million Reichsmarks a year. Uh, but they were willing to pay that because it seemed like, again, it was a valuable way to indoctrinate workers. Now remember, working class people traditionally, particularly in the bigger cities like Berlin, tended to lean toward the political left. So it was seen as a way of getting those people who had leaned toward the political left during the Weimar years, maybe been out and out communists, to try to drag them into kind of the Nazi idea here, right? Into Nazi thoughts here. In 1938, Ley stated, quote, strength through joy is the shortest formula to which national socialism uh, for the broad masses can be reduced. Strength through joy is the shortest formula to which, the, to which national socialism for the broad masses can be reduced. This is the way you get to the working classes. This is the way we educate the working classes in national socialism. Uh, again, you could also visit countries like Finland, Portugal, Switzerland. You could go to these other countries, and the Nazis made it affordable here. Um, in 1934, in 1934, 400,000 Germans took vacations that were subsidized by Strength Through Joy. 400,000. 1934, 400,000 Germans take vacations that were subsidized by Strength Through Joy. Okay? Just three years later... 1937, 1.7 million Germans are engaging in strength through joy. So 1934, 400,000. 1937, 1.7 million. And again, you also have a number of, I say, smaller vacations and smaller cultural events and concerts and stuff that people are going to as well. As I say, many Germans who are participating in these things they're, they're kind of cynical because they know they, they're going to have to engage in these Nazi propaganda. They're kind of cynical about it. There was one fellow who, who remarked to a spy for the Social Democratic Party in exile in Prague, one guy that remarked to, to one of these guys, he said, quote, um, if, it, if you get it so cheaply, if you get it so cheaply, meaning the, the vacations, if you get it so cheaply, then it's worth raising your arm now and Get it so cheaply, it's worth raising your arm. It's very cynical, right? Yeah, we'll go along with it. We're getting good vacations, right? Did I tell you about the Young Lions? Did I talk about the Young Lions in here? Has anybody ever seen that movie, The Young Lions? It's like from the 50s. It's with uh, Marlon Brando and Dean Martin. The Marlon Brando stuff's really good. The Dean Martin stuff, whatever. Montgomery Cliff, whatever. But there's a great scene in The Young Lions, Okay. Right, the first scene of the Young Lions, Marlon Brando's a ski instructor, and it's New Year's Eve, just about to come 1939, and Marlon Brando's a ski instructor in southern Germany, and he's got this American girl there he's teaching how to ski. Well, it's just about midnight, so they say, well, let's go into the lodge and celebrate New Year's. So they go into the lodge, the clock strikes midnight, they all raise their hands and cheer, yay, it's New Year, New Year, and then all of the Germans start going, how Hitler, how Hitler, how Hitler. And the girl gets kind of upset about this. And she just walks outside with Marlon Brando. He's been Highland Hitler. He's a German. He walks outside and follows her. And, and he says, what, what's the matter? She says, well, I can't believe you're doing that. You know, I can't believe you, you, know, you seem like such a reasonable guy. Why are you, why are you doing that? Why do you follow Hitler? 
and he says, so I teach ski courses in the winter. This is kind of my wintertime job. So this is what I, what I do all year long. You know what I do when my main job is? She says, no. I'm a shoemaker. I make shoes. He says, I make shoes. <coughs> my father makes shoes. And his father makes shoes. This is what our family does. It's what we know. He says, but I didn't want to be a shoemaker. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor. But it's not like America. I can't just work hard and become a doctor. In Germany, it's kind of who you know, and it's where you were born. And you can't escape that in Germany. That's why I support Hitler. He's changing that. He's breaking down these class barriers. He's breaking these things down. So that I know that one day, if my son wants to be a doctor, he'll have that choice. And I thought that was great, because it, 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 it really showed for a second what a lot of Germans were thinking about what Hitler was doing. He was breaking down these kind of class ideas. And this strength or joy here, that's kind of another way. Again, seemingly, he's doing that. Now, is he really doing that? No, not at all. But he's making it look like he's doing that. Give you another example. Nazis, they had a propaganda film where they show this line of SA stormtroopers. And they show one guy, and he's standing there, and he says, this is Baron Freyhar von Klustenberg. And he, he comes from a long line of German nobility. And he stands with Hitler. And then they go to the guy next to him. He says, this is Willy Schmidt. He's a metal joiner from B Wedding Berlin. And he stands with Hitler. These two people from vastly different backgrounds are one in the struggle. You know? And, then, and, it, and, it, and it's this great propaganda. You're rich, you're aristocratic, you're poor, you're working class, and it doesn't matter. We all stand behind Hitler. Right? It gives that impression. But then as soon as, of course, the camera goes off, as soon as that rallies over, what happens? The Baron... He goes back to his home, takes off his uniform, puts on his tux, has his servants, you know, serve him. Willie Schmidt, he goes back to his hovel, puts on his dirty clothes, and he goes back to work at the factory. So it's not, the, the Nazis are brilliant at papering over class differences. They're brilliant at papering over class differences. But they're not really doing it, right? They're not really doing it. Now, of course, one of the other great things the Nazis are obsessed with that they think can help to paper over class differences and, again, make them look good and win popular support is Hitler, of course. Oh, there's Strength or Joy. There's Look at that. The showgirls for Strength or Joy. Isn't that great? They got a little swastika emblem right there on there. I mean, it's ridiculous. Hitler believes in technology. Technology and automobiles. Everybody should have a car. Everybody should have a car. So Hitler wants to design a car that every German can afford. Every German family should own a car. So he wants to create this car. So the DAF actually financed production of the Volkswagen. The Volkswagen. The people's car. The people's car. In fact, Volkswagens were originally known as strength through joy cars. Strength through joy cars. Hitler, he actually sketches the design himself, the, the rough design of, of what the car should look like himself. But then he gets Ferdinand Porsche to actually engineer the things. Hitler intended for one million Volkswagens to be built every year. One million Volkswagens built every year. Now, Porsche had been known for designing racing cars, but he brings them on board to help him design this, this great car that's going to be this boon to, to Germany here. And when Hitler makes the announcement of, of this car public, Germans are go wild. They think, oh, this is awesome. We're all going to own cars. This is fantastic. Prior to the announcement of the Volkswagen, most Germans, or at least many Germans, certainly a lot of working-class Germans, they never thought they could ever possibly own a car. Again, a car was something a wealthy person has. And now you're telling me that I can own my own car, I can get around the city however I want to get around it, I don't have to take public transportation. You're telling me I can own my own car? Thank you, Hitler, right? That's what these people are thinking. He's doing this. He's leveling these class distinctions. He's making it so wealth 
doesn't, you know, I, I, I don't have to be wealthy to have these kinds of luxuries here, right? So the regime, it pours money into advertising these things. It encourages Germans to save up their money to buy one, and they're expected to be ready. Uh, there's prototypes that come out fairly quickly here, but the, the actual production line cars are expected to roll off the assembly lines in 1939. 1939. Uh, Hitler actually, in February of that year, he unveiled the first prototypes. Hitler unveils at the International Motor Show in Berlin. And the, one of the very first prototypes of the Volkswagen, he gives to Eva Braun, his girlfriend. Everybody wants a Volkswagen. And it's the, 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 the demand for it is so wild. And the manufacturers are like, well, we can't really keep up with this. We cannot keep up with this, with the demand here of this. By 1939, about 270,000 Germans had put in orders, had put money down, essentially, for their Volkswagen. So by 1939, 270,000 Germans had put money down for the car. Others had placed orders that they hadn't yet put down. So I think the total people that had placed orders, uh, including those that had put money down and not, was about 340,000. So people, they're literally telling people, you need to wait to put money down because they're scared they can't keep up with it, Right. Um, however, something happens in 1939 that is somewhat significant. <laughs> um, a war starts, so just before the first production models can roll off the assembly lines, they, f they turn all of the factories into war production. They turn all the factories into war production. <clears throat> So the Germans that actually invested in the Volkswagen, any guesses to when they actually get those cars delivered? 1960. 1960. So over 20 years later. 